Right, we'll kick things off. Um, firstly, uh, a big thank you and welcome to everyone. Um, it's uh, great to have you all here. Uh, I know it's uh, sometimes quite hard to fight you all from traffic and be here at five o'clock, so it's much appreciated. Um, your uh, time and presence is uh, very, very welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Matt Harvey. I head the Investor Relations team at Jasper, and it is a pleasure to be working alongside colleagues once again, uh, specifically Charlie Oscroft and uh, Chris Omley, uh, to help promote the uh, Jasper Industrial Income Plus Fund. Uh, a quick agenda for the evening. Uh, shortly we'll hear from Chris Tennant-Brown, uh, a senior economist at ASB, uh, who will be highlighting uh, the global and domestic economic <coughs> trends, uh, inflation expectations and interest rates. Following Chris, we will hear from um, Ian Little, who will give us a snapshot of his views of the industrial property sector. And following Ian, we'll hear from Mark Campbell, uh, Chief Executive, or Co-Chief Executive, I should say, at Jasper, uh, who will be presenting the opportunity uh, that we have to invest in the Industrial Income Plus Funds and talking about the investment thesis, the various strategies that we have for that offer and of course the reasons why both Mark and myself are investing in this offer. Uh, importantly, we've got some drinks and nibbles after the uh, event, so please stick around. I uh, look forward to mixing them in with you all. Um, so I'll pass the mic over to yourself, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having me along here. and. Um my first uh, forecast that I have to stick with is that I can do my update in 10 minutes. So uh, I'll do be a cracky. And I just need to go those congratulatory thoughts about managing to beat the traffic and to get in here. It's certainly uh, nice to be meeting with people face to face. I've taken to putting my picture on my presentation over the last year or so because almost everything was done over Zoom, it seems, and uh, it's much, much better to get out and become to mix and mingle. So um, the bottom line for uh, economists uh, is things are getting a lot better, a lot quicker than what we thought uh, a, a year ago. And it's one of those times where it's quite nice to be wrong when you're wrong and, and the outcomes are, uh, are just so much better than we thought. I've got a slide here of global growth prospects up on, up on the, those two grey bars there, or what we think the, global, the, the growth of our key trading partners will be like over the next couple of years. We can see that the hole we fell into last year was much deeper than the previous recession we had in the global financial crisis uh, when it came to what was going on for our trading partners, uh, but the bounce back that we're, we're experiencing now and, and expect to continue over the next uh, couple of years is, is stronger. Related to this, the, the, the chart down the bottom is our key export commodity prices which are very strong at present. Um, if you're uh, into dairy, we're forecasting a, a milk price of uh, around $8 for the, for the year ahead, which is pretty good for the rural community. But we're seeing strong prices in other parts of the economy as well. We'll touch on uh, what that means for inflation later on, uh, but for us as an exporting nation, this is pretty, pretty good news. The, the missing bit at the moment uh, for New Zealand is obviously tourists. And so when we say the economy is back in terms of size um, and has recovered, economists are thinking about GDP, um, or gross domestic product, um, and the unemployment rate. Uh, but clearly there's still things to do in the economy and the tourism sector uh, is, is, is not back uh, to where it has been. Um, but overall it's a pretty good mix when we're seeing this sort of growth outlook for our key trading partners, these sorts of export prices, and the vaccine rollout hopefully providing a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. When we look at how the economy is going now and what we expect, um, what's interesting is that the, the pandemic at this stage doesn't look like it changed the economic cycle. It actually just pushed pause on it for a while. And the bounce back has been very, very strong. And now we're seeing some of the things that we worried about and talked about prior to the pandemic, so thinking back to December 2019, some of the things like capacity pressures within the economy, difficulty finding staff, difficulty getting projects done on time, have really just re-emerged as, as things within the economy. And um, when the other speakers are talking about um, property, I'm sure they will talk about that as an area for the construction sector. It really is going gangbusters at the moment. Um, 
but we have seen a, a, just a complete return of the pressures that we worried about prior to the, to the pandemic. We look at uh, indicators of activity, um, such as investment intentions with the ANZ's uh, Business Outlook Survey. Uh, they're running very, very strong at the moment. But some of those capacity pressures, difficulty finding staff are, uh, are emerging as constraints as well. Now, I mentioned before I was a senior economist, and um, that hasn't been as difficult as you'd think. Um, over 20 years, really, if I didn't know what was going on, all I needed to say was I think interest rates will go down, and chances are I would have been right. And for the past 10 years, I could say, don't worry too much about inflation. And uh, we didn't really have to worry about it. Um, inflation was averaging over the past five years, just a bit over 1%. Um, in the previous Reserve Bank Governor um, Graham Wheeler's term, uh, inflation was often between 0 and 1% and um, looking at consumer price index. So nothing to really worry about. And um, when I was at university, we always talked about using monetary policy to keep inflation down. Well, we've had 10 years where we've tried to use monetary policy to push inflation up. But that um, game seems to have very rapidly changed um, in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, some of the things that are um, magnifying inflation pressures, normally one of the downward forces on wages in New Zealand, for example, is, is migration flows, people coming in. And we're seeing massive supply chain interruptions at the moment, um, difficulty getting uh, stock into New Zealand, very expensive shipping that's putting inflation pressure into the economy. So people are having a debate right now about whether this inflation is transitory or whether it's the start of something more permanent. People are also worried about with the amount of stimulus that's going on into, into the economy. Will that ultimately be inflation, inflationary as well? Well, it's here right now. This consumer price index surprised everyone uh, when it printed earlier this month. Uh, annual inflation is now running at 3.3%, uh, and we think the economy is going well enough for the Reserve Bank to uh, start to raise interest rates. Now, that's not exactly music to the ears of, of people in the property game. Low interest rates have been part of the driver for uh, property appreciation uh, for quite a while, so I want to put a bit of um, comforting thoughts around, around that. We think the Reserve Bank will hike a couple of times this, this year um, and then begin to gradually lift interest rates over the next couple of years. And we're already seeing that influence things like the five-year term deposit rate, which has gone from 1% to 2%, the five-year mortgage, which has gone from 299 to 399 um, Only the very short terms, 90-day um, rates, those sorts of things are still anchored by that record low official cash rate. And if we're right in our forecasts, um, they'll start to lift soon too. But over the course of the next five years, we think that the type of interest rate increases we'll see through the economy are probably a percent or a percent and a half from here. So by no way are we forecasting rates going back to the painful levels that we've seen over the preceding 10, 15 years. Within my job to forecast more interest at the bank. So I'm thinking that over the next two or three years, if we get a, a shallow tightening cycle from the Reserve Bank, um, we'll probably see mortgages settle between that 4 and 5% range for, for home loans, which on a historic basis is still incredibly low. This won't cause widespread problems in property markets for the simple reason that any borrowing is stress tested on much higher rates than that. Uh, for example, in the housing space, the um, typical rate that you'd be looking for um, testing a, a, a mortgage um, is someone's ability to pay an interest rate in the 6 to 7% range. So if it was going to cause major problems with the economy, the Reserve Bank simply wouldn't be doing it. And I'll get a lot of bite with minor increases given the, um, the level of debt in the economy and that even a quarter of a percent adjustment from these levels makes, uh, makes quite a big impact. So that's coming over the next um, over the next year, we think. Of course, as we've seen in Australia, um, situations pretty fluid and can change quite quickly. But I really see this as a um, as a positive factor about the, the, the economy and, and how it's tracking. I also see things like um, property investments, which have got some um, things like uh, CPI-based uh, rent resets, 
has been quite good protection about the, the inflation that's now back within economies. We've noticed within um, customers that we talk to, now that they've seen turn deposits go up a little bit, they're thinking, oh, maybe I'll just wait and see if they get better from here. Um, but the fact is that a, a 2% term deposit is a lot more attractive than a 1% term deposit. But if inflation is running at 2.5% for the next five years, which is what we're forecasting it to average, you're not getting a real return out of that. And it's important that people finally have inflation back in their mind as something to, uh, to factor into investment returns after many years when it hasn't been um, a front of mind concern because it's been so much lower. So I'm happy to stop there and I'll take questions now rather than at the end of the presentation because I'm sure that you'll have a lot more questions to ask about the actual uh, investment then. So if anyone's got a question they want to ask me now, so how's a good time? Um, good evening, uh, I'm from Colliers and uh, so welcome to our offices, our new offices. Uh, we just uh, took occupation in I think about mid-January and I think you'll agree it's a superb spot to me isn't it? If there's an, argument for working from the office as opposed to working from home, this is surely it, particularly if, like me, you uh, live in a 50 square metre kennel at the top of the Illinois Road. Um, so it's a, it's a great place to be and uh, welcome again. Um, so I see, I thought there was going to be some more stuff here. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks a million, Chris, for um, the uh, information on that economic backdrop. And I think you know, the message that came across very clearly was that uh, look, New Zealand has, uh, New Zealand's economy has performed so much uh, more strongly than we thought it would do uh, well, just over a year ago when we were all working from home and locked down, weren't we? And, um, but the, the strength of the economy and the outlook uh, for it is clearly one of the uh, most significant drivers for the property market because what it does is it sets the sentiment. Uh, and we test the uh, sentiment on a quarterly basis. We send out a questionnaire and ask people whether they think that they are optimistic on the outlook uh, for property investment, i.e. our rent is going to go up, our capital value is going to go up, or do you think you're uh, pessimistic and you're uh, looking at things trending the other way? Uh, and we've shown that on the chart here, and you can see that obviously uh, as we went into lockdown uh, last year, um, pessimism was uh, very much on the rise, wasn't it? We all thought that we were going to see some major corrections uh, in values of assets, particularly residential and commercial property. Um, but look how quickly that sentiment has bounced back over the last few months as the uh, information we've had on the economy has just got better and uh, better. Uh, and in fact, in the uh, latest survey here, which we uh, just included uh, in uh, June, uh, the level of optimism has reached an all-time high. So uh, people very much thinking that, um, look, the worst of the disruption of uh, COVID-19 is uh, behind us, the economy is well set, uh, and that's giving people uh, confidence to continue to transact in the uh, property market. Um, now, obviously, I wouldn't say that um, you know, everybody's viewing all asset classes in the same way. And we can see that there is a difference in uh, the outlook um, depending upon uh, what sector that you are talking about. So I guess uh, in Olympic parlance, so the Olympics still on, by the way, I don't know, I haven't seen the news for a couple of hours, so um, I'm assuming the Olympics are still on. So probably the bronze uh, medal winner would be um, uh, retail. Obviously, there's been uh, concerns about retail. Um, but look, even that, the, um, the confidence or the outlook uh, for the retail sector has bounced back very strongly over the last uh, few months. And that's a result, I guess, of the fact that we've seen a lot more um, consumer spending. In fact, a huge lift in consumer spending uh, over the last few months, which has really bolstered uh, the market. And um, when we look at some of the uh, headlines about uh, resellers struggling, we're really talking about strip retail and, and primarily in secondary locations. Uh, look at what's happening in the malls. They're practically all full. Uh, and they're generating high levels of uh, footfall and high levels of consumer spending. So they're well supported. That bulk retail sets, a large format retail, has performed very strongly. Uh, in actual fact, its, um, its outlook has probably been improved uh, by the uh, COVID lockdown as people have transitioned their spending uh, towards things like uh, electronics to set up the home office, uh, uh, renovating the homes, etc. So we've seen a huge lift in spending uh, in that large format retail sector, uh, and that's lifted uh, confidence um, considerably from where we were a year ago. The office market, well, look, the demise of the office market, again, has uh, proved to be incorrect, hasn't it? Um, we've seen more and more uh, businesses 
uh, looking to get their staff to come back to the office more regularly. Okay, there's more flexibility perhaps than there was uh, pre-lockdown, but um, look, people are very much understanding that if you want to build company culture, if you want to drive innovation, uh, you really need to have people working collaboratively together, uh, and the office environment uh, still suits that very well. But look, the gold medal winner, and uh, ironically in gold, is what's happened to uh, the industrial sentiment around the industrial sector. It's been enormously popular. So if you um, take uh, the number of uh, uh, optimists and you remove the number of uh, pessimists, we're still at a sort of net rating of about 70% uh, for industrial. And uh, that, of course, is driven by the fact that uh, the fundamentals for the industrial sector have been so strong and have been strengthening. And again, in some ways, uh, some of the benefits that the industrial sector uh, provide have actually been accentuated by um, uh, the COVID lockdown and what's happened there. We've actually seen uh, a number of the, um, of the occupier groups uh, benefiting from it as we've seen lifts in, in demand. And that's been shown by what's happened to uh, occupancy rates within the, um, within the industrial sector. So you can see that these have fallen away over a number of years really from, a, from when we started to emerge from the global financial crisis uh, and they dipped to uh, incredibly low levels. So demand has really been running well ahead of uh, new supply. And despite the fact that we've seen a, a very small lift uh, in both Auckland and Wellington uh, over the last year, the uh, overall vacancy rate still sitting at uh, just a smidge over 2%. So incredibly tight uh, conditions. So that uh, obviously sets one of the very strong fundamentals. We've got very high occupancy levels. And if we look ahead, we expect that to uh, be maintained. Uh, and that comes back again to what I was mentioning earlier, that we're seeing growth in a number of the sectors uh, that provide occupiers for industrial property. So e-commerce, as we all know, has gone bananas. In fact, we're all forced to do all our shopping uh, on the internet, weren't we, just a few months ago. People find it's convenient. They know how to do it now. And so we expect to see that uh, huge lift uh, being maintained uh, as people have uh, adopted it as part of their retail life. So, um, according to uh, New Zealand Post, we spent about $5.8 billion uh, on online transactions in 2020. That's 25% more uh, than we spent in 2019. In the States, they say for every billion uh, additional dollars that uh, you spend uh, online, we need about 100,000 square meters of, um, of uh, warehouse space. So our um, spend over 2020 was by 1.2, 1.3 billion dollars more than it was in 2019. So you can see that that's really underpinning demand for logistics, last mile, delivery stations, etc. Um, we all want secure data, so data centers are becoming uh, a much more common feature, and um, certainly we're seeing in areas which uh, uh, meet the requirements for them, so flatland, close to um, secure power, etc. We're seeing uh, premium prices being paid uh, by the developers so that type of property for industrial land. And then the other supports, infrastructure, we've seen a huge lift in infrastructure spending. The government wants to spend $12 billion on their New Zealand upgrade. And of course the construction sector. Uh, the housing shortage across the country is slowly being eroded as we've seen a huge lift in construction activity. 44,000 new homes uh, consented in the year to May, the highest uh, number ever in the history of New Zealand. So these are all industries that require industrial space, they're driving demand for industrial space, and uh, that's why we're seeing those really low vacancy levels. Uh, because despite the fact that uh, probably in two of the last three years we've seen some relatively high levels of development. It's certainly not uh, outpacing uh, the level of increased demand. And look, a lot of that is driven by the fact that it's just very difficult to find land on which to construct industrial properties. If you think of uh, most of our established uh, industrial precincts, uh, the likes of uh, East Hamilton, etc., cetera, um, look, all of the land that's going to be utilized for industrial space there has already got industrial premises uh, on it. Uh, so much so that we're now seeing uh, land values increasing to a level where it's almost uh, unviable to build industrial properties. So we'll see change of use, etc. Uh, so certainly, look, uh, new supply is constrained, and as a result of that, of course, we're seeing new industrial precincts opening up on the periphery of the city, uh, to the north in Silverdale, for example, uh, to the site of Drury, and uh, further south along the motorway connections, uh, and out west, of course, where we've had the, um, the Western Ring Road. 
uh, improving the um, improving the road network out there. Uh, so what's happening into uh, sales? Well, look, uh, this is the uh, annual value of uh, commercial industrial sales uh, from uh, 1988 through to 2020. And you can see that generally the trend has obviously been up. Uh, 2020, we saw a slight uh, dip uh, compared with the previous couple of years. Uh, and that was driven by the fact there wasn't much activity, obviously, uh, March to June, March to September uh, last year. Um, but if we look at this fascinating graph here, um, you can see nothing. Um, I don't <laughs> quite know what's happening there, but um, you can trust me that what's happened in the first quarter of 2021 compared with the first quarter of 2020 uh, is that um, uh, the value of transactions is actually higher. And indeed, um, on the basis that we're probably still going to see some uh, sales being reported uh, because there's a bit of a time lag. Um, we're going to get to potentially a position uh, in quarter one 2021 where a new record value of sales has been achieved. And look, that's um, what we're not seeing is a huge lift in the number of transactions. So that's all driven really uh, by the increase in uh, values. The increase in values is driven by, as I say, the, uh, the strong fundamentals uh, for uh, property. Uh, but also, it's been driven by uh, this downward trend in interest rates, which uh, Chris talked about over a number of years. Uh, as interest rates have fallen, uh, people have been forced to look elsewhere to try to generate the sort of returns uh, from their savings uh, that they need to uh, live the lifestyle that they require. And doing that from having money in the bank has become increasingly difficult, almost impossible, in fact entirely impossible for the vast majority of us. Uh, back in uh, the 1990s, if you wanted to generate the average wage in um, interest, uh, you wanted to uh, generate $26,000 per year, you needed to have about a quarter of a million dollars in the bank to do that, which I guess was pretty achievable back uh, then. In December 2020, though, interest rates have fallen to less than uh, 1%. Uh, deposit rates have fallen to less than uh, 1%. Uh, the average earnings are $65,000. So uh, if you want to deposit enough money to generate that $65,000, uh, you need $7.8 million. Um, now, most of us don't have that in pocket change. If we did, we probably wouldn't be here. Uh, so look, um, this has driven people to uh, invest their money elsewhere look for high yielding assets and uh, particularly in the last couple of years or in the last year with interest rates being slashed in order to support economies uh, we've seen a huge weight of money uh, being transferred to high yielding assets so share markets have reached uh, new records uh, just a few months ago and of course the value of property we've seen it in the residential market and we're seeing it in the uh, commercial market the value of properties has increased uh, as yields have compressed and we can see that, I guess, in, um, in uh, this graph here. So, look, as, a, as an investor, you can invest in uh, something which gives you total security, totally risk-free, uh, and that's uh, shown in this dark blue line here, which is uh, the return on 10-year government bonds. And you can see that over an extended period of time, those have fallen away. Uh, so to generate a higher return, people are looking for uh, alternative assets. And we've shown the average uh, return on industrial property over that same <laughs> period of time in the uh, lighter blue line there. And you can see that, um, obviously, yields have tracked those, um, those uh, risk-free returns uh, down. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is obviously, you know, you need to require, you require a risk premium. Uh, if you're buying uh, property as opposed to a uh, risk-free government bond. And that normally sets somewhere between sort of 25 and 3%. And you can see that's really been maintained right throughout this cycle. Uh, and at the moment, it's sitting at about 2.5, 2.6% based on our figures, although that bond rate obviously changes on a daily basis. So that gap, the premium uh, gap, has remained pretty consistent. Uh, and uh, which would indicate that um, you know, we're not moving into bubble territory uh, for the value of those industrial assets. Um, but as those yields have come down, as, as the lower yields get, the higher property values are. Uh, and that, of course, has uh, generated uh, higher returns uh, from industrial property over the uh, last few years, and particularly in the last year. These figures are supplied by MSCI. Uh, and they uh, add the cap, uh, the uh, return on your income, so basically uh, rental, 
that comes from the property uh, and they add that to the capital, uh, any changes in capital value. And you can see that, uh, look, across um, the major sectors, we've had a very, very strong uh, year uh, over 2020, 2021. 16% is the average return uh, generated by all property. And you can see that really now, over the 1, 3, 5, 10 and 15 year periods, it's been double digit returns uh, across all property classes. Uh, but look who the star performer has been. It's been industrial, 11.6% uh, annual uh, total return generated on average over 15 years. And look at the return uh, in this last year as we've seen that yield compression really starting to impact uh, values. 21.8% uh, uh, return generated in the year to March. Uh, and just to sort of um, uh, put that in some sort of real world context, I guess we've just put a few sales up uh, there of industrial properties that have sold within the last sort of six to nine months uh, across the country. And, um, obviously there's uh, varying prices there depending on the size of the uh, property, etc. Uh, but one thing to look at is the consistency in the types of yields that uh, these properties are commanding. Really everything from uh, about 3.75% or 3.8% to just like 4.5%. So uh, real consistency in the, uh, types of, uh, in the types of return which are being generated uh, by properties. And it really is very much uh, consistent uh, across the country as well. There used to be uh, quite a big variation, I guess, in the types of returns that you would expect if you're buying in Auckland against farms from North, or, uh, for example. Um, but we've seen that uh, gap being compressed as well over the last couple of years. Uh, and that's it for me in summary. Um, obviously, the economy has exceeded expectations and the bolstered confidence. Uh, the industrial market is uh, benefiting from uh, very strong uh, long-term fundamentals. Uh, and uh, we've seen that low interest rate environment uh, boosting the amount of money uh, which has been targeted uh, at uh, industrial assets and that obviously has had a flow on effect into uh, values. So I'm hoping that, um, like Chris, you don't have any questions for me and therefore I can hand you straight over to Mark. Is that the, uh, is that the situation? I'm off there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, really good question. We'll, I will come to that and we'll talk all about sort of the hedging strategy that we're that we're looking at implementing for the fund in light of everything that's going on in the market, so we'll go over that in a little bit of detail. Um, before I do, we uh, just want to talk a little bit about, about Jasper generally. So uh, Mark Campbell, I'm one of the co-CEOs at Jasper and one of the founding team for the business. Um, so the business itself, we're, we've been operating for sort of two or three years, um, so relatively new to the market. Um, but really experienced, sorry, if you can't hear me in the back there, um, but really experienced team, executive team, and board of directors that sit behind the business. So um, we're effectively, as we say there, a digital platform for investing in commercial real estate assets. Um, in a lot of ways, we're, we're a traditional fund manager. You know, we're out there, we look at um, technical difficulties there. Um, we're, we're looking at a number of investment strategies in the market and we're raising capital for those investment strategies for a number of different places, um, whether that be to diversify the core value add industrial. The, the sort of point of difference for our business is we have a, a very large technology component where ultimately we're looking to add sort of efficiencies and innovation to that fund management environment. Um, a lot of you guys will sort of know what I'm talking about there, having come through the, the onboarding process at Jasper and having invested in, our, in the last capital raise in December, if you're, you're nodding there. Um, and, and a lot of that is, as we know, commercial real estate investing generally is, is, is pretty old school and we've, we've got a sort of world-class tech engineering team that's, that's ultimately looked to solve a lot of the pain points of that process. So your investor onboarding, all the AML, uh, we've got a really frictionless process there. How we actually showcase the assets in our fund, um, the investment process itself, and, and upcoming after this capital raise, we're looking to launch our, our secondary market to sort of solve that, that liquidity piece or add liquidity to commercial property um, as an investment class. So Jasper itself, in a lot of ways, we're, we're a fund manager. We, we focus on commercial real estate at the moment, but we have a big tech component to the business, which you know is a real point of difference for us in terms of our competitors in the industry. Um, just to touch on the uh, the leadership team. So as I said, yeah, Jasper is uh, quite a new business uh, in the market. 
Um, we've been operating from around 2019, um, but we've got an incredibly experienced executive team, uh, chairman and, and board of directors. So myself, just to give a little bit of background on me personally, um, I've been working in commercial property for sort of coming up 15 years now. Um, originally in Auckland, did, I'm get myself back. <laughs> Originally in Auckland, uh, did three or four years here. This was back in sort of 2007-2008, sort of pre-GSC. Um, worked with the Goodman guys um, here, who are obviously great operators in the market still currently. Um, a heavy focus on industrial property. So I was sort of into sheds um, from, from right at the beginning of my career and sort of continued that on um, throughout. So did a few years with Goodman in the New Zealand market. Um, I went over to London, ended up doing 10 years in London, so I was in London from 2009 to 2010. Again, worked for Goodman in the European operation, again we were running sort of portfolios of, of incredibly large logistics assets, sort of 100,000 square metre sheds for, for Amazon. Um, and other sort of e-commerce providers. I, I then did the last sort of five years um, working on some pan-European value-add industrial funds, not dissimilar to uh, to the Income Plus Fund, just at a, a bit more greater scale. So we had a, a sort of US private equity partner and we grew a fund there of about 12 billion NZD, sort of over a thousand assets of very similar stock to, to the Income Plus assets. So it's very much in my warehouse, it's very much my experience over the last 15 years of my career. Um, and, you know, as a co-founder in Jasper, it was sort of always where we were going to start in terms of the investment offerings on our platform. Um, and not to mention all the tailwind behind the sector, but I will come to that. Obviously, you guys know Matt, who heads up our investor relations, and you'll be sort of dealing with him on a day-to-day -day basis through this capital raise. Just, just quickly, Ken Gardner, our chairman and one of our directors, he's sort of he's based in New Zealand and again runs sort of billion dollar operations across the globe. Really well renowned guy in the commercial real estate space, um, and perhaps a few familiar faces here for, for for some of you. Craig Donaldson, really well known around the New Zealand market. Um, his background in financial markets, so we've leaned on him a lot through this interest rate hedging and strategies in and around that, given what's going on in, in markets at the moment. Nick Beal, the managing director of RCP, you know, one of New Zealand's biggest project managers, and John T. Count, who's sort of built a number of global tech companies around the world. So, as I say, one, we're a relatively new business, but, you know, a heck of a lot of experience across the board from, from the Jasper team and also our, our, our advisors. So, coming to the fund, um, we're really proud of the of this offering, or we were back in December, um, in terms of the initial three collection of assets that that we aggregated there, you know, we, we spent as a team uh, sort of six months um, pulling those three deals together to, to launch what was really the first uh, the first offering on the Jasper platform. Um, so initial three assets, we've, we've added two new assets. Again, we've, we've really as a team spent sort of six or seven months um, out there sort of searching and scouring the market. You know, I think conservatively we, we've looked at, at, well, hundreds of millions of, of opportunities across certainly the Auckland market which is the main focus at the moment, but to actually come to a landing on, on two assets that we are you know, ultimately comfortable enough to, to add to the, to the fund and to not obviously dilute the quality of, of the existing three assets that, that we put in. So we've increased the size of it quite, quite significantly. So we were original asset value there of 25 million. That goes to just under 70 million now across the five assets. We're raising 21.8 million of new equity at a 5.25% pre-tax cash return um, and push that wallet out considerably to eight years. So I want to um, dive into a bit of the detail on the individual assets. Uh, again, a little bit about the fund. So obviously we've, we've had a core focus on, uh, on Auckland Industrial. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about sort of going to, uh, spreading the wings to the Golden Triangle, looking at Hamilton and Tauranga markets. Ultimately, haven't found a huge amount of stock in those markets that we've felt um, was strong enough to add to the fund, although we do obviously have an asset in there for Pocono, which we'll touch on in a minute. Um, so incredibly well diversified across those, those, um, across those assets in the Auckland region. Um, the 5.25% cash return and push that wealth out, as I say, to, to eight years. Um, Ian sort of touched on industrial sector generally, which, which I'll come to. Um, and come best with us, there was a point that Matt made of the, the Jasper team, the executive team, our advisors, our board are all sort of co-invested in this offer alongside you guys. Um, again, a little bit about where, where we've come from, from 8th to December, which was inception of the previous fund. So we're 25 up to 70 mil, um, added, the, added the additional two assets, we're up to six tenants, still 100% occupied. 
uh, obviously, and, and considerably pushed that wealth out to eight years with the, with the two new assets having sort of long underlying leases, um, and, and a very really nice, really nice spread of tenant industries and diversification across a number of different sort of a, a, a tenant. Tenants there. Um, we're still predominantly focused on Auckland, 66%. We have uh, obviously acquired a rather large asset in Pocono, uh, and, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Just in terms of that, uh, I want to highlight the total return since, since inception of the existing fund, so annualised at 21.1% there. That's for those three existing assets. Um, we've had sort of significant valuation growth in that underlying portfolio since we acquired. Uh, so we acquired for just over 25.2 million. Um, and currently valued at 27.5 million, which actually given sort of market comps and, and sort of evidence, we, we think is actually really conservative for that existing portfolio. So we feel really good about those existing three assets and what was really important to us was just to not dilute the quality of this fund and obviously a big sort of concern for investors of any new assets that we wanted to introduce, which is why we've been you know, really meticulous about actually out there and searching and, and, and finding a couple of new acquisitions that we feel comfortable adding to this portfolio and you know really pleased with the two assets that we uh, that we have found um, so I'm just going to dive into the dive into the, the assets here we'll start with your Shealy Drive uh, down in Pocono um, really interesting story with this one uh, so we uh, the, the Pocono story itself is interesting there's a huge amount of development and infrastructure industrial and residential going on in that pocket um, so when we said we, we you know, didn't want to venture too far from Auckland, you know, there's got to be a really strong fundamental story for us to be comfortable anywhere outside the greater Auckland region. Um, I think with Pocono, you know, we have found it. Uh, there's a number of big occupiers in this area from an industrial point of view. There's a huge amount of development going on in and around that area from, uh, in terms of resi and industrial and commercial. Um, and it is really right on the convergence of that sort of state highway one south to Hamilton uh, and East State Highway 2 to, to, uh, to Tauranga. So it sits nicely at the sort of focal point of the Golden Triangle for us, so we were comfortable um, going down here for, for another investment. So it's, it's, it's a large asset, obviously just under 25 million. Um, NZ Drinks as an occupier, as you can see, these are, these are sort of the hero images of a, of a lot of the content that you would have seen for the fund. Uh, it's obviously an incredibly impressive uh, industrial building. They're pretty much brand spanking new. Uh, so one was built, the, uh, this one here was built in 2016 and then to increase capacity or to increase capacity for NZ Drinks from a manufacturing point of view, they, they built them the second shed in 2020. Um, the really interesting story about this one is if I uh, carry on down, so NZ Drinks are obviously a manufacturer and bottler of, of water. Um, they have their own brand, Pure NZ, which you are probably quite familiar with and have seen around supermarkets. Their revenue is quite nicely split, about 50% of their own brand into NZ Drinks or Pure New Zealand Drinks. And then they do a ton of manufacturing and bottling for actually a lot of the high, uh, of the big supermarkets, sort of Woolworths and uh, Countdown and New World and others. So it's got a nice split of revenue there. Um, the, the, guys that, the guys that are actually acquiring the asset off are sort of the, uh, have developed a lot of this Pocono area. Um, and whilst they were developing it out to some of these big occupiers, they, I wouldn't say stumbled, but they came across basically an underground aquifer that sits about 50 metres from the building just down here where, talk about sort of stumbling on a gold mine, um, they, they stumbled on this thing which ultimately they were going to have to pump in water from, from the Waikato or from sort of further up into South Auckland, but actually they were able to access this underground aquifer and they've, they've essentially agreed a resource consent which allows them to pump 5,000 cubic metres out of the ground on a daily basis. Um, so who's your perfect occupier? Obviously a water and drinks manufacturer is, is, is pretty good. I think in the hundreds or over a thousand of industrial assets that I've managed or acquired or been involved with in my career, that is, that is probably the strongest story in terms of an te entrenched tenant or a tenant with a real reason to be there. So they actually, um, might be a bit of photo here, so they're, they're actually pumping that water out of the ground and it's coming up into these two 5,000 litre tanks. Um, and then they've got a huge amount of manufacturing um, or machinery in this half of the warehouse where they're actually sucking that up out of those tanks and man well, bottling that water. And they do sort of over 30,000 bottles uh, per hour, um, all, all with recycled plastic. 
Uh, it's an incredible operation. The rest of the warehouses are ultimately sort of high-level racking, um, but they're looking to expand their machinery through, oh, throughout this building here and add additional racking over here just to increase that manufacturing capacity. So it's it's the ideal spot for them. Um, you know, they're, they're incredibly entrenched in that space. The actual quality of the water is quite interesting. Um, I, I won't claim to know the full science behind it, but uh, essentially the water that has seeped through the uh, through the bedrock, uh, has done so over a period of just under 200 years, uh, or 180, 190 years, which means that it has seeped through prior to sort of a lot of pests and other things, it's incredibly high, so, so it works really well for, for, for their brand, that sort of pure New Zealand clean and green uh, image. Um, and, and you know, they've, they've got a wonderful operation there. They uh, domestically want to have sort of one of the largest market shares for bottled water. Um, what they're doing and one of the reasons behind actually expanding into this, uh, this, this guy here in 2020 is to increase their, their manufacturing capacity and look at, if they have sort of really nailed the New Zealand domestic market. They ultimately want to look offshore um, and look at other markets and they see a real opportunity there. Just before we, we went unconditional on the asset, actually, they've, they've had a bit of an influx in capital into the New Zealand drinks business to basically facilitate that expansion offshore. Um, so, you know, amazing operation there, really entrenched tenant, uh, a great reason to be here. They've obviously committed to the site for a 12-year lease, um, and, you know, there's every chance that they'd be there for much longer than that. Uh, the resource consent to actually enable the, the 5,000 cubic metres to be pumped out of the ground, that runs to 2034, so that's a couple of years beyond that lease expiry. Um, now, we, we've, we've talked to the guys a lot about this and sort of probability of that being renewed, but actually that, um, that, that aquifer or that water actually supplies, this is Yushili uh, Dairy, this is Sinlay Dairy, that's Heinz Pipes, um, we might have it here, yeah, Yushili, Sinlay, Heinz, there's a, uh, a, a large, uh, a whole new multi heat industrial development going on here. There's a big new retail development going on here, sort of commercial retail space, um, because they're actually servicing quite a big residential population now. There's, there's sort of consents in place for another 7,500 homes just sort of around the corner. So it will become a, a real hub, and you know, that water is supplying that, that whole area, and you know, there, there's every chance that that will just be continually renewed and they will be an occupier in this building, we hope, for a very long time. So, great story, they've got a great operation, um, and, and just in terms of the underlying bricks, it, it would, would probably be one of the highest quality industrial buildings we have in, in the portfolio um, now. Uh, so, uh, so, one that we're really proud of to acquire, um, yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's the, the biggest rent roll there, and they've, they've obviously term out's 2022, and they've got uh, sort of three yearly market reviews uh, throughout that period. So. Um, that's the story behind New Zealand Drinks, a really interesting one, but a great asset for us. And, and the only reason we'd really feel comfortable sort of stretching our legs outside of the Auckland market. Um, I'll carry on, uh, time being a factor. Uh, so Six Rhyme Place, um, this is the, the second addition to, to the fund, or the new asset to the fund. Um, again, uh, we really like this location, so I'll just click through. Um, so this is in a Mangari, Mangari, just past Mangari Bridge um, and just off State Highway 20. So reason we've targeted a, a, quite a few assets in this location. Well, we've targeted assets in this location for a while. Reason being, um, what they're trying to do is sort of a wider Auckland plan is to kind of redirect heavy traffic away from here, away from the CBD, away from the Harbour Bridge, round State Highway 20, Northwestern, State Highway 16 and North and South. Um, so there's a huge amount of activity in these industrial pockets that sort of border that State Highway 20 motorway, also State Highway 16, which is one of the other assets in the portfolio that we'll come to. Um, so we're, we've been targeting this pocket for a while and it was great to get our foot on this asset here. Um, ultimately, it's, uh, it, it's, going backwards. it's good quality, generic, medium stud, uh, industrial warehouse space, incredibly relatable. There's very little, if any, vacancy um, in this pocket. Uh, and, and you know, there's a real strong reheading story. So uh, the story behind this building is uh, the, the vendor who we're acquiring it off will ultimately become the tenant. So it's a sale and leaseback structure. Um, they acquired it back in 2016, 2017, um, and it was reasonably tired at that point. They've done a heck of a lot in terms of refurbishment of the building over the last three or four years. You can probably tell it's sort of brand new office, it's brand new facades, they've resealed the yard. They've replaced the office roof. They're currently doing a ton of works on the warehouse roof, um, just essentially to get it fit for purpose for their operation. Um, so it's a really clean industrial shed for us. 
Uh, they're doing a sale and leaseback transaction, so they will ultimately be the occupier of the building, um, and they've committed to an eight-year lease. A um, little bit about the tenants, so Exhibition Hire Services, they have a few different companies that sit under that banner, um, but effectively they're, provide, they're providing services and equipment for the, the event industry in New Zealand. Um, now, the event industry in New Zealand has you know, been one of the busiest sort of globally, given we have been open or not subject to major lockdowns um, at all, really. So these guys have been flat out. Um, I think they have committed to an eight-year lease. Um, we've also agreed a 12-month bank guarantee that sits in behind that. So you've got 12 months of rent sitting there in case anything did happen with that tenant or in case they came in trouble. But it is worth noting that that business has been operating for just under 30 years um, and, and you know right through COVID and everything else and performing really well now. But we have the security of a 12 month bank guarantee. I think the thinking is, you know, if you ever did get this building back vacant, you've got 12 months of lease security there. And in terms of a re-letting story, it would, it would re-let really well with low vacancy in the area. Um, because it was the vendor selling ultimately to themselves as a tenant, the rents in our view are actually quite conservative um, because ultimately they, them as their business will be paying those rents. So it's off a reasonably conservative rental level um, and we feel really good about the re-letting story. But ultimately we think we've got a great tenant in there for, um, for eight years. That just gives you a bit of a picture of the rest of that pocket. You've sort of got Auckland Airport access and, and North on State Highway 20. Um, a couple of little points to note that you may have you may have read it in the IM. Um, what the vendor is doing some works on the building at the moment, um, so we've effectively committed to the transaction subject to the vendor completing those works, and that's around some rebracing, which is a seismic point. Um, it's essentially just some reinstatement of how the building originally was or was originally designed. Um, we actually just had confirmation today that. That process is going really well. Council has sort of ticked it off. They're going to do the works in the next week or so. Um, and then we've got a one month period to settlement, which means it will line up pretty much uh, bang on at the end of August with the NZ Drinks asset in Pocono. Um, so we're committed to it and the vendor carrying out a couple of little minor works within the building. Um, and, and then we're really happy with that acquisition. Again, it is one of the larger ones at 17.5 uh, million, but just really good fundamentally. Um, uh, a medium stud industrial space in a great little Auckland location. Um, so eight year lease, as I say, with a couple of rights to renewal. Uh, rent review structure, fixed 2.5% increases. Uh, and then we've got a market review every four years so we can catch some of those tailwinds. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Let me know on time, by the way. Um, I'll, I'll, so that, that's the two new assets. Um, I will touch on the existing portfolio. Some investors who have been in the previous round will obviously know these assets well, but there are some updates here. Um, so West Point Drive, uh, this was sort of the previous hero image of the fund and, and an asset that we're, that we're also really proud of. This goes to that story similar to Rhymer, Rhymer Place, so all of that, that traffic and, and heavy trucking that's going to be sort of funneled through State Highway 20 and State Highway 16 um, ultimately is going to benefit the Hobsonville pocket, which is why we targeted it originally. This was pretty much a new, well as you can see, pretty much a brand new build warehouse when we acquired in 2019. Um, obviously purchase price 9.3, current valuation at 10.5 mil, which is obviously a great story for us, I think. In terms of comparables in this area, this, you know, in our view, that is actually uh, fairly conservative. Um, we've still got seven years on the wall. So just to talk, touch quickly on the tenants, um, Futura Trailers are an occupier in the front unit here. Uh, business is absolutely going gangbusters. They've just uh, agreed a whole lot of new contracts for a new range of boating trailers and jet ski trailers. Quite an interesting operation they've got going. They'd actually ideally like to expand from the front unit into the back unit and take the whole site. So we're working with them on that to see if that's possible with the rear tenant. Um, but ultimately business performing really strongly um, and again, a great pocket. Um, so that's looking back into Auckland and this Hobsonville pocket is relatively new. A lot of the stuff here is new build. Um, this, this picture here is a little date, well, it looks like a bit of a construction site all in and around here. So this is a main freight land. Main freight are building a big DC here. You've got a data center going in on the corner and a couple of other small developments going up. So it really is filling up. Most of the land being taken up, but really a creative pocket to, um, to the fund and just a, just a super high quality um, asset. Again, Futura Trailers, the one that I mentioned, business absolutely performing really well. They had some issues around supply during COVID, like a number of business does. They see how it or did. They seem to have come through through sort of the woods on that one, and, and the business is absolutely flying. And they're coming to us saying 
hey guys, we've got six years left on our lease, but we actually need to expand in the asset. And you know, that's a wonderful story for us from a tenant perspective, um, certainly in the current environment. Uh, so that's West Point, just touching on Tidal Road, actually all of these assets go to that story. Um, just on location, again, this is State Highway 20, um, Rhymer Place is just a little bit further on, so this is on the other side of it. So again, going to that story, that shift in traffic flows, if, if we came back to around here, there was a lot of land, there's a huge amount of new industrial development going on, um, a lot of really impressive new builds, which is ultimately just going to reset sort of market rents in this, this little sub pocket. Um, Tidal Road itself, uh, again, pretty generic um, standard industrial space. Scott Tech, really interesting occupier uh, there, sort of uh, robotics and process machinery manufacturing. Um, they do a lot in the food and meat processing industry. Um, performing really well as well, I think, through the pandemic, the, the use of machinery and robotics and, and that, that sort of process manufacturing were far more prevalent in the pandemic for sort of health and safety and operational efficiencies and other things. They've won a ton of new contracts since we actually acquired, and I think share price is up by sort of 50% of, of what it was last year, um, and, and way far above pre-COVID levels. So underlying business there going really well. Um, one thing we did do on this existing portfolio is, uh, and certainly with some of the slightly older stock, is we went through and did a big sort of capex um, analysis when we acquired. So we've done various works to these assets. We've sort of done some tidy ups on the roof here, some window fixings, we're working on the crane, and the electrical distribution board, just some tidied up sort of preventative maintenance stuff, all was, was budgeted in the original capital raise and for, sort of foreseen during our DD. So nothing unexpected. So ultimately, the asset's performing really well. There is a, uh, there's a step for rental increase from 338 to 380K in, in, a, in a month or two, um, which effectively aligns it with where the current market would sit for this particular tenant. And then they've got some fixed and market rent review structures going forward. A small bit of shots here. So this is sort of the Papakura industrial uh, industrial precinct looking out. Um, really good asset again, it's sort of medium stud, pretty generic industrial stuff, split across three tenants. You've got Thompson's ITM, really well known brand there. They're sort of buoyed by all the construction activity going on in and around this area, but also for the new sort of Drury Town Centre development. Um, County's Aluminium on the corner actually, they've just, great story, just <laughs> renewed in the asset for three years. Um, with no rental incentive and, and at, a, at a nice uh, high market rent. Uh, again, buoyed by all construction activity in this sort of wider South Auckland uh, area. Um, and then another tenant, Kiwi Beverage, who sells sort of drinks into the supermarkets nationwide. Um, generic space, it's, it's a great little asset. Um, really low site coverage there, so ITM utilise all of this yard. Great for their operation, they sort of couldn't find that space, heavy industry space anywhere else. Um, but ultimately, as, as the industrial market itself sort of continues to tighten, there's potential for sort of some further redevelopment in that area. Same as Tidal Road, we've done some CapEx works, we've upgraded one of the roofs um, and just some sort of minor preventative maintenance stuff. Um, we've actually also agreed market rent reviews for, well, for all three tenants now, which is an interesting point. Um, this is in certainly the most, well, aside from Pocono, the most southern uh, asset in the portfolio. We've had really strong market rent growth there, sort of seven, seven and a half percent, um, just because of how tight this market is. Um, there's a few new developments in the area that are pushing those market rents up, um, which is a great result, which is it's sort of a wider a point to make around interest rates going up and market rent growth in the industrial sector generally. Um, so Hanua Road, you can see it there highlighted, a couple of new developments going on in and around, um, and, and tenancy schedule there. So we've still got 20, County Aluminium was the only lease expiry that we had to deal with in the entire fund in the first year, um, and that's that's all renewed and pushed out for three years, and tenants all going really well there, so so a nice story there too. Um, so before I, it's, it's a reasonably quick sort of helicopter view of the, um, of the fund itself and the new assets that we're adding. I suppose I just wanted to touch on before we wrap up, um, uh, Chris's points and, and Ian as well, just around interest rates and how we're looking at that and how we're thinking about that. So obviously a very topical point in the media at the moment. Um, so 
I guess, uh, I guess the, the way we think about it is why are interest rates going up? And ultimately that means the economy is performing better than expected, certainly domestically. Um, Ian touched on it in, in quite a bit of detail, but the demand drivers behind industrial property in particular in terms of the construction sector, the infrastructure spend, the e-commerce tailwinds, are incredibly strong, particularly in the Auckland market. So de those demand drivers are there. Coupled with interest rates are going up because we're going into an inflationary environment. Now, inflationary environment, when you think about it in terms of commercial real estate, is actually a positive because what you've got there is increasing construction costs, increasing replacement costs, which ultimately puts more of a strain on supply. Now, the reason we're so heavily invested in industrial property in Auckland is because of it's ultimately very supply constrained. Ian mentioned it, there's just not a whole lot of land that we can go here, um, and a lot of it has been built out. So you've got a really land supply constrained story. You've got replacement and construction costs going up, which are putting more pressure on that. Um, vacancy rates are at all time lows, slightly up at the moment, but I think certainly peaking. Anecdotally, we're seeing so much demand for space, even across our portfolio, even though it is fully let. Um, so you've got really strong demand and supply fundamentals, which are putting pressure on market rent growth. We've got a really nice spread through the portfolio. You'll see it here. Market rents for this asset on every second anniversary of the commencement date were about 50-50. So what I mean by that is 50% of the portfolio is subject to market reviews and 50% is either fixed reviews or CPI. So CPI is obviously going to benefit again in an inflationary environment. But as long as you feel comfortable that your market rent growth is there, at Hanua Road and Papakura, we've seen it, we've just executed three market rent reviews. Um, even in a rising interest rate environment, you're going to you're going to be able to main, certainly maintain or grow that five and a quarter percent return. Um, so, in terms of the supply demand fundamentals, we feel we feel pretty comfortable about it. Uh, in terms of thinking about it as part of the industrial property sector, how we we're thinking about interest rates. Um, yes, there is a lot of rhetoric at the moment about interest rates rising, but. I think the Reserve Bank, I think it's going to be gradual and it's going to be measured. I think you have to just look at what else is going on in the world and not too far further afield in the world. If you look at Australia, we've got Delta variant careering through there. Most of those states are currently in lockdown. Um, we've still got our borders closed and for the foreseeable future, I'm not sure any of us really know when they are going to open. Um, so yes, they have to sort of temper this inflation environment, which I think is still ultimately a positive here, but it's not going to be interest rates rocketing up. I think that's going to be a gradual increase over the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months. Um, in terms of how we're then thinking about our interest rate management strategy and how we're dealing with that, given all of that, finally getting to your point. <laughs> um, so what we've, um, we've agreed a margin uh, with, with our lending bank, um, and that margin is fixed for two and a half years on the new assets coming into the fund. So we've got good tenure there. Then you've effectively got a, a floating or variable component of that interest rate. So what we've modelled or, or what goes to that 5.25% return is that we could effectively hedge our exposure to adverse interest rate effects up to 50%. So we could essentially fix 50% of that variable rate for two years and leave 50% floating. The reason we want to do it that way is, yes, you want to hedge your 50% of your exposure against any adverse changes in interest rate, although I believe they will still be gradual. And you want to leave 50% of your exposure variable because we still want the benefit of the fact that we're coming off 0.25 as an OCR um, and we're still off you know, historical lows in interest rates. So we still want the benefit of that, but we still want to hedge against the risk of, yes, interest rates are starting to creep up. So we've built in quite a lot of quite a lot of headroom into that uh, into our numbers and into that 5.25 percent return, so that we can ultimately put a good strategy in place around interest rates, get the benefit of the low, but also hedge against interest rates as they rise. I think touching on the key covenants of our of our debt strategy, it's sort of the loan to value ratio and the interest coverage ratio, and ultimately the what. Um, loan to value ratio, we're at 48 percent. Again, we feel really comfortable at that level. I think. Because the existing portfolio, whilst we have had it revalued at 27.5, we ultimately think, given comparable evidence, that is that they are very conservative values. We have plenty of headroom from our lending bank's perspective for covenant, to hit the covenant. The other one they look at is your interest coverage ratio. Um, a sort of benchmark there is two times you need operating income. The fund is currently sitting at around three and a half times. Um, and the bank's benchmark on Walt is two years. Well, obviously we're up at we're up at eight years. So, in terms of the the sort of key debt covenants around our lending, um, we feel really good about that. 
uh, and, and that's sort of the strategy that if that answers your question. <laughs> um, and in terms of the impact of values, uh, yes, I think it may have an impact. Um, yields have been, again, Ian pointed out, have been sort of, uh, have been going down at, at quite a rate for a time, and maybe that will start to be tempered, but ultimately I think those fundamentals of the sector are still so prevalent, you're going to continue to see that market rent growth, which is ultimately going to hold up values or, or continue to see <laughs> values increase. Um, so you've got the same sort of um, uh, review timeframes as well as you Exactly right, exactly right. And a range of review structures so you can capture market rent growth, but you've also got some surety around a fixed rent review. CPI is great, or CPI plus one, because you're obviously going to get the benefit of that inflationary uh, environment. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's probably me. I mean, just to summarise, with you know, the team's worked incredibly hard to pull these new two assets into the into the fund, um, you know, we're really proud of these acquisitions, we've worked really hard on them for the last few months, um, the team has all co-invested in this fund along, alongside our new investors and yeah, we're, we're delighted to sort of present it to you and really appreciate you guys coming out to, to sort of hear the story tonight. Um, I think we'll, we're, the, myself and there's quite a few of the Jasper team in the room, we will be around for an hour or so and it'd be great to, you know, take some queries offline or catch up with a few of you if, if we can or if you can stick around for a beer.